Six. Are you ready for the last part of chapter five? Kensuke's Kingdom. Here we go. From high on my hill, I did catch distant glimpses of the old man. Often in the mornings, I would see him spearfishing in the shallows, sometimes alone, but often accompanied by a group of orangutans who sat at the beach and watched him. Fourteen or fifteen of them I counted once. Occasionally, he would be carrying one of the young ones on his back. When he moved amongst them, it seemed almost as if he was one of them. Time and time again, I tried to stay awake until the old man came with the food at night, but I never managed it. I never even heard him, not once. But every morning, the water would be there, the fish too. It often tasted smoky these days, which I liked better. The fruit would not always be the same. Much of it was strangely scented and not at all to my liking, but I ate it anyway. Besides bananas and coconut and berries, he would leave me breadfruit or jackfruit. At the time, of course, I had no idea what these were. I ate everything, but not so greedily now. I would try to save some fruit for an evening meal, but I could never bring myself to save the red bananas. They were just too delicious to save, and I ate them all at once. My recurring nightmare was the mosquitoes at night. From dusk onwards, they searched me out, buzzed in on me and ate me alive. There was no hiding place. My nights were one long torture, and in the morning I would scratch myself raw in places. Some of the bites, particularly on my legs, had now swelled up and become suppurating red sores. I found relief from them only by dunking myself often in the cool of the sea. I tried sleeping in another cave, deeper and darker, but it smelled dreadful. Once I had discovered it was full of bats, I left at once. Whenever I slept, the mosquitoes found me out soon enough. It got so that I dreaded the coming of every night. I cried out aloud in my misery as I swiped and flailed at them. I longed for the mornings, for the cool of the sea and the cool of the wind on my hilltop. Here I would spend the greater part of my day, sitting on the very summit, looking out to sea and hoping, sometimes even praying too, for the sight of a ship. I would close my eyes, tight shut, and pray for as long as I could, and then open them again. Every time I did it, I really felt, I really believed there was a chance that my prayers would be answered, that this time I would open my eyes and see the Peggy Sue sailing back to rescue me. But always the great wide ocean was empty. The line of the horizon quite uninterrupted. I was always disappointed, of course, often dejected, but not yet completely despondent, not in those early weeks. I had severe problems too with sunburn. I had learned rather late that I should keep all my clothes on all the time and I made myself a hat to keep the sun off my face and my neck. It was very broad and Chinese looking, made of palm leaves, the edges folded into one another. I was quite pleased with my handiwork. Sunburn, I discovered, was a discomfort I could help to prevent and that seawater could soothe. At noon, I would go down the hill to shelter in my cave from the burning heat of the afternoon sun and then afterwards, I would go swimming. This was the moment Stella longed for all day. I spent long hours throwing a stick for her. She loved it, and, to be truthful, so did I. It was the highlight of our day. We'd stop only when the darkness came down. It always came down, surprisingly quickly too, and drove us back once more to our cave, back to my nightly battle with my blood-sucking tormentors. One day, after yet another fruitless morning of watching on the hill, Stella and I were coming out of the forest when I spotted something lying on the sand, just outside our cave. At a distance, it looked like a piece of driftwood. Stella got there before me and was sniffing it over excitedly. I could see it now for what it was. It was not driftwood at all, but a roll of rush matting. I unrolled it. Inside, and neatly folded, was a sheet, a white sheet. He knew. The old man knew my miseries, my discomforts, my every need. He'd been watching me all the time and closely too. He must have seen me scratching myself, seen the red wheels on my legs, on my arms, seen me sitting in the sea every morning to soothe away my sores. Surely this must mean that he had forgiven me now for lighting the fire. 
I carried the matting inside the cave, unrolled it, wound myself in the sheet and just lay there giggling with joy. I could pull the sheet right up over my face. Tonight, there would be no way in for those cursed mosquitoes. Tonight, they would go hungry. I went racing along the beach to the boundary line where I stopped, cupped my hands to my mouth and shouted, Thank you! Thank you for my bed! Thank you! Thank you! I didn't really expect an answer, and none came. I hoped he might come himself, but he didn't. So, I wrote my thanks in the sand, right by the boundary line, and I signed it. I wanted so much to see him again, to talk to him, to hear a human voice. Stella Artois had been a wonderful companion to me, good for confiding in, good for a cuddle, good for a game, but I so missed human company. My mother, my father, lost to me now, perhaps forever. I longed to see the old man, to speak to him, even if he was a bit mad, even if I couldn't understand much of what he was saying. That night I was determined to stay awake for him, but comfortable in my new matting bed, protected and swaddled in my sheet, I went to sleep quickly and never woke once. The next morning, after a breakfast of fish, jackfruit and coconut, Stella and I made our way back up to the top of my hill, or Watch Hill, as I'd begun to call it, the other one I'd named His Hill. I was repairing my Chinese hat, replacing some of the palm leaves. It never seemed to hold together for very long. When I looked up, I saw a ship on the horizon. There was no mistake. It was the long, bulky profile of a super tanker. Show you a picture. See that there? Mm. And that is the end of chapter five. I've really enjoyed reading this story to you, boys and girls. Almost made me feel like I was back in the classroom with you all. I'm going to pass the story on now to Miss Secret or Mr. Brady. You'll have to wait and see who's next. I hope you enjoy the next part of the story. Take care, boys and girls. Stay safe. Bye. <laughs>